Hi and welcome back to a new video. We're still almost one week away from the embargo to talk about performance, but I received a ton of new hardware, so like motherboards, memory kits, and there seem to be a lot of open questions, especially from the previous video regarding cooling and especially regarding memory that I want to address in today's video. And especially when it comes to also motherboard prices, what is going on there? We will start with the memory topic. I received three memory kits in total. The Kingston Fury kit was included in the MSI review package. This Corsair kit was included in the ASUS review kit. And then we have a G-Skill one that just came standalone. All of those three kits are CU DIMMs, CU memory. So that is something completely new, the first time in the DDR5 era that we are talking about a new technology that was brought to DDR5 in general. And there seemed to be a bit of confusion in the previous video also regarding supported memory speeds. It is true that if you run normal UDIM, like you have at home right now, DDR5, on one of those Arrow Lake motherboards, the max supported speed is 5600 mega transfers. If you're switching to one of those new kits with CU DIM, then 6400 mega transfers is officially supported. You surely saw the Seasonic MacFlow fans in one of my videos before. Seasonic also offers them in an ARGB version. With a different fan blade design, RGB inside the frame and also subtle RGB in the center, these fans focus on both design and performance. The MacFlow ARGB are also daisy chainable and can easily be expanded and connected by the integrated magnets that couple the fans without additional clips or tools. Seasonic also includes a small RGB controller if you want to avoid annoying software issues. Find out more in the link below. This is a normal UDIM DDR5 module. UDIM for unbuffered dual inline memory module. So if you plug it inside your motherboard, you will have a direct connection between the memory that is sitting in the slot and the CPU. Nothing in between, that's why it's called unbuffered because there's no buffer in between. When we're talking about the CU DIM, there is an extra component sitting in the middle here that is called the clock driver. That's where the C in the CU DIM comes from. Now these are G-Skill Trident C5 CK 8800 mega transfers module. And if we take a look underneath the heat spatter in the center, you can spot a chip like right here. And that is the so-called CKD. That's also probably why this module is called CK. But I'm not sure where this CKD comes from. As far as I know, the chip underneath is called the client clock driver. So that would be CCD instead of CKD anyway. It's actually a bit easier to see on those Fury modules. If we peek underneath here, they even put a thermal pad on top. Not sure if that's something that's required that you have to cool the clock driver. And apart from that, I'm not even sure how to tell that these are CKD memory, CK memory, CU memory, a lot of different terminology. Well, at least it's written here that it's CU DIM. But apart from that, not that easy to tell. But if you look underneath the IHS, you can usually spot it. With Intel Arrow Lake, the rumors are that we can expect very high memory frequencies above 9000 mega transfers. And for those memory speeds, it's apparently advised to use those CU DIMMs or CK DIMMs because the, yeah, the clock driver that's sitting on here will receive the clock from the memory controller and then is repeating the clock again. So the, yeah, the clock driver on here will send the clock to the memory module itself. And that is apparently much more stable once you reach frequencies above 8 thousand mega transfers. What kind of frequency we will be able to run in the real world? That is a good question and it's definitely open and I mean if you look at the fact that the Apex which is a one DIM per channel motherboard so two memory sticks in total is listed with 9000 mega transfers max or like plus and then we have for example the MSI ACE C890 which is a four DIM board and this is listed with 9200 mega transfers which is I mean, if that works on a four DIM board, that is quite impressive. They explicitly list that it's only running the speed if you only run two sticks. Still, with four slots present, yeah, that, that's quite high. There seems to be another interesting change in Arrow Lake when it comes to how it gains access to the memory DIMMs. If you look at, for example, a 14900K, it has two memory channels. And here we have on this motherboard only two DIMMs, so it's quite easy. We have channel A and channel B. And then memory controller zero, for example, would access channel A. And then memory controller one would access channel 
B. The Arrow Lake memory controller is no longer 2 times 64 bit, but it's 4 times 32 bit. And it's also gaining access in a different way. So, for example, memory controller 0 can access those upper portions of the memory slots, and memory controller 1 is gaining access to the bottom pieces of the memory slots. That also means that because you have 4 times 32 bit, it can access this one and this one and this one and this one individually. This was maybe a bit confusing, I'm just trying again with a memory module from DDR5. It's also nothing new, the DDR5 technology itself has always been supporting this, that you can gain access to like the half portions of the memory module. But as far as I know, it's the first time in desktop that this is happening. So it doesn't increase the overall bandwidth, because if you just gain access to the full memory module, it will still be the same. But it would allow, for example, to do on one half portion of the memory stick, you could do like a read or a write cycle. And on the other half, you could do like a refresh cycle, for example. And that's just possible because of the 4 times 32 bit split up versus the 2 times 64 bit split up. Quickly going back to the high memory speeds, one thing you have to keep in mind. For example, if you're currently running DDR5 8000 Raptor Lake, then it's very likely that you're running the so-called gear 2 mode. And this mode explains the ratio of your memory frequency to the memory controller frequency. So for example, with 8000 megahertz, your real memory frequency is 4000 megahertz, and the memory controller frequency will be 2000 megahertz because of the gear 2 mode. If you would switch to gear 4, it means that your memory controller would only run in 1000 MHz. And that is usually what's happening with those high clocked memory kits. So if you want to run like 9000 mega transfers upwards, then again, your memory speed would be 4500 MHz. But with gear 4, the memory controller would only run 1125. And that's something you have to keep in mind. So depending on like what memory frequency you're looking at, it could be that, for example, 8400 gear 2 might outperform 9000 gear 4. But that's something we have to test. I was talking to some of the memory vendors and at least one of them pointed out that one mainboard vendor apparently solved this issue and that gear 4 would run the same speed as gear 2. I'm not sure how that would exactly work out, but we will see. Quickly going back to the topic cooling, because two of those review kits that I received came with AIOs that have offset mounting kits. MSI included this core liquid i360 AIO and with this stock mounting bracket you would typically mount it on your motherboard. But then I spotted that they also include this offset mounting kit. And as you can see this one is no longer universal, that's just for 1851. Placing both brackets directly on top of each other, we can see what they did. And I would say it's about two millimeters to the right. So, I mean, it's flipped right now, but it would push the cooler two millimeter to the right and about, I would say, three to four millimeters upwards. So it's upward shifting by three to four millimeters and about two millimeters to the right. The Asus Ryujin Extreme also has this kind of offset compensation mechanism. It's kind of better integrated as with the MSI, but technically a bit worse, because you can see you can switch it back and forth, like I did it, like this. So you can only push it a little bit upwards to the hotspot, but you cannot push it to the right, like MSI did it by about maybe two millimeters. We're not allowed to talk about the actual numbers yet, but just the fact that the AIO makers are already including offset mounts shows that there will be a thermal benefit in shifting the cooler towards the hotspot. Also, if you just look at what happened in the past with the previous CPU generations, you can kind of estimate that it's maybe two, three, four degrees Celsius, but probably not like 10 degrees Celsius. Talking about hotspot and cooling, I can already show you a prototype of our micro direct die direct die cooling block. And this is also kind of like a special edition today at Thursday shooting this video. It's also the first time that we finished one of the white and silver edition blocks that we just made because Asus decided to do this white and silver thing again. And I just think it will fit the motherboard much better than the typical black version. And with this direct die water block, we also already incorporated the hotspot shift to north and right a little bit. Talking about the Apex, Asus. Why is the Apex white? It was so nice that the previous gen, it was a black motherboard. I think that was one of the reasons why it was selling so well. And now we have this like white mainboard again and with like a lot of silverish stuff because you obviously can't do white anodizing for 
the aluminium heat sink, so yeah, not a big fan, not a big fan. If we look at the different motherboards from ASUS, like the C890 Hero, beautiful looking board, just getting rid of two memory slots and uh, would be close to an Apex, I guess, or like the Extreme, which also looks very nice. One thing that's not nice is the pricing. ASUS, what the hell is going on with the pricing? If we look at the Hero, C490, four years ago, a Hero would cost 400 euro, and now this one costs 800 euro, double the price in four years. That is completely crazy. Almost as crazy as this one with 1,400 euro for just a motherboard. There's no CPU included, no memory, no, no SSD, right? And obviously you could argument this is PCIe Gen 5. And it obviously makes everything more expensive, signaling, PCB, everything. But I just can't imagine how you go from PCIe 3.0 with the Hero Z490 to 5.0 and not a lot more features to just double the price. That's completely insane. But there are also other examples, for example, the MSI C890 Ace, which costs 700 euro. And I don't want to say that 700 euro is cheap. It's just a different comparison because all those ASUS motherboards, they increased about 200 euro in price. Whereas if I compare the C690, well, the, the 200 euro price comparison is from C690 to C890. But this one from C690 to C890 is like 20 euro price difference. So not that much. And if we look at how the ACE is equipped, um, this basically has everything that I would ask for. It has a 10G Ethernet, Wi-Fi 7. We have a ton of USB A 3.2 Gen 2, a ton of USB type C. So yeah, basically everything that I would personally need. Now with the Hero, we have, well, we have a dual Ethernet, but it's not 10G, it's 5G and 2.5G, and we have 11 times USB. We also have Wi-Fi 7, but yeah, overall compared, this motherboard is like 100 euro more expensive than this one, and it has less. Well, the Hero has less than the Ace. I'm not a big fan of the Ace when it comes to the design, but that's pretty subjective, but just, yeah, the pricing of these motherboards is completely nuts. The extreme is extreme, especially in regard of how overpriced this is if you compare it to the Hero, that's already overpriced. But this really doesn't have that much more to offer. Like M.2, you have I think four here and you have like six here and you get two additional M.2 on the DIM.2, so that is different. You have a very nice VRM design and cooling layout, so that is definitely different to the Hero. You have a huge LCD that will allow to show system info live, like, I don't know, CPU speed, CPU temperature, which is cool. Unfortunately, we can't show it yet because I would have to power on the motherboard for that, which I think we're not allowed to do, but I mean, this is 600 euro more and I'm just asking myself the question, what for? Like for, for a display and a different M.2 design and a bit of different VRM layout and heatsink. Wow, crazy. I forgot to add the connectors on the front. So this one, the Extreme has 10G Ethernet. It also has 2.5G Ethernet, so it's still dual. It has dual Thunderbolt 4 and a different USB configuration than the Heroes. There, there are differences. It's a bit more high-end, but I think the, the, the price difference is absolutely insane. And it worries me what kind of yeah, trend we're seeing. I think it's not healthy for our industry if we see this kind of drastic price increase. Like how many people will be able to afford a 1,400 euro motherboard, like 800? I think it will just, yeah, in a result, have even lower sales than what we're already seeing this year. Like this year has already been quite difficult for our industry and I think those kind of prices are not helping. Next video will finally be Arrow Lake running instead of just dry talking. I hope you still enjoyed this video. See you next time. Bye -bye.